Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to talk about South American independence for as long as my voice can hold out here, and so apologi apologies in advance for the quality of this recording. I'll probably have to record it again later once this uh, sinus pressure relieves. But for right now, let's talk about Simón Bolívar and South American independence. So here's the various objectives for this unit, for this lesson. Take a moment and take them in, and let's dive into our story. So the Spanish colonies, as we talked about uh, up to this point, were a relatively decentralized political force. The Spanish were mainly concerned with extracting as much gold and converting as many people to Christianity as possible, the three Gs that we talked about. And so they divided most of their territory into these broad vice royalties with a sort of sub-king or viceroy ruling over them, exerting not that much day-to-day -day political pressure. Instead, local councils called audiencias ruled out of each of the major cities. These councils of sort of leading officials made most of the day-to-day -day decisions within the Spanish Empire and controlled a lot of the actual power power, despite the fact that the vice royalty theoretically had absolute power coming from the king. It's also important, important to note that Latin America, and especially South America, is very geographically divided, and so we're going to see a lot of assaults over high mountain peaks as sort of the coastal mountains along South America are going to play a really important role in our story going forward, preventing various independence and unification movements from succeeding. The Latin American colonies, despite their massive amount of wealth and the huge amount of silver they were extracting from these colonies, as well as the other cash crops, uh, were economically uh, subservient to the mother country. Mercantilism was an accepted practice by basically everyone here, and even within the Spanish colonies, they were closed sort of economic systems. And there was very, there was very little tr legal trade allowed even between the various cities. And so if you were in Cartagena and you wanted to get something to Veracruz, you would have to ship it all the way back to Spain, where it could be taxed, probably in Cadiz here, and then ship it all the way back across the Atlantic Ocean again to Veracruz. This was extremely, extremely unpleasant for most of the people living in the Spanish Americas because it led to significantly higher taxes and led to significant unrest and smuggling from within the Spanish colonies as they attempted to subvert and get around what they saw as totally unrealistic economic policies. At the same time, as we talked about previously, the encomienda system and later the repartimiento labor system were the two sort of basic organizing facets of society. The vast majority of the society at this point was Native American, but everyone else was divided up into this racist caste system with white people on the top, mixed race people in the middle, and enslaved and Native Americans on the bottom. As we talked about in our Enlightened Monarchs episode, Charles V did put on this new class of peninsulares on the very top of the social class, which created significantly more outrage because it's obvious to all, hopefully it's obvious to you all, why the mestizos, Native Americans, and enslaved people would be unhappy with this caste system. But the creation of this new class of peninsulares also outraged the Creoles, who were European, who were fully European, born in the Americas. They had significant amount of wealth and held on to a lot of these offices, but they were being now locked out of the highest levels of government by the arrival of these peninsulares, these intendants who answered directly to the king. This was an attempt for the king to rule his colonies more directly, but it really ended up alienating the local elites, who at least up to this point were sort of copacetic with the status quo. And so now you've got a system in which basically everyone who's not showing up from Spain hates the current system and would like to see at least some measure of change. So here is us to take a moment and read the letter to the Spanish Americans describing the situation here. Guzman's letter is one of the uh, seminal documents in Spanish American independence. So pause and answer the questions and we'll move on. One of the other things that convinced the local elites that they needed to leave some sort of rebellion is we started to see a variety of different Native American rebellions. Uh, most famously, the rebellion of Tupac Amaru. Uh, Tupac Amaru was a Native American leader who took on the name Tupac Amaru, claiming he was the descendant or the reincarnation of the last Inca king. And he launched a massive rebellion against the Spanish after they expelled the Jesuits from their colonies. Hopefully, as we remember, the Jesuit order was a, group of, uh, was a group of Catholic missionaries who would come in and learn the culture and learn the language and sort of integrate into Native American society and then try to teach them about Christianity sort of in ways that they could understand, kind of an appropriate teaching style method. But the Spanish were worried that the Jesuits were becoming too friendly with Native American groups and were not loyal enough to the king. 
And so they were expelled from the Spanish territories. Tupac Amaru led a massive Native American revolt in Peru, both pushing back against the expulsion of the Jesuits and also, of course, demanding better working conditions, better treatment for Native Americans, uh, relief from the sort of corvée forced labor requirements. And the rebellion was put down, but it was massively expensive, and it convinced the elites of the Spanish Americas that change needed to happen from above, hopefully, or else it would be forced by people rising up from below. Uh, they had also just watched the whole Haitian Revolution thing happen, and there was some fear that if the Native Americans rose up, they would go all uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines and uh, kill all the Creoles, the Criollo. And so there was this push for more reform. Tupac Amaru himself was drawn and quartered with his uh, limbs sent to various parts of Peru as a warning to others that you best not rebel against the Spanish Empire. The very first attempt to establish independence for the Spanish American colonies is the Leander expedition led by Francisco de Miranda, this uh, white haired guy right here. Francisco de Miranda had long dreamed of Spanish American independence. And so the Leander expedition was a partially British funded expedition. Uh, Francis Miranda had been sort of hanging out around the Caribbean and hanging out in England, trying to get support from other European countries to lead a Latin rebellion in Latin America. Obviously the British want to break the Spanish colonies away because then they can trade with them, things like that. So they helped to finance this expedition, but it went spectacularly poorly. Miranda and his men were, Miranda and his men were, were uh, stopped. Miranda was arrested, his men were executed, and Miranda would spend some time in jail before eventually getting bailed out and fleeing back to a house on Grafton Street in England, where he would go on to try to support other Latin American revolutionaries. Uh, Miranda is known as the precursor. He's going to come back in our story in a minute here, but this was the first attempt to establish Latin American independence. The thing that really kicked off the whole Latin American independence movement was Napoleon's conquering of Spain. As we hopefully remember from earlier in this unit, during the Peninsular War, Napoleon invaded Spain to get to Portugal, deposed the King of Spain, and put his brother Joseph on the throne. This is known as the Abdications of Bayan, and when this happened in Spain, the Spanish government collapsed, and each local region of Spain set up what's called a ruling junta, or a ruling council, to govern in the absence of a king. All of the Latin American countries did exactly the same thing. They started establishing their own ruling juntas without any authority from the central junta in Spain, and they began ran, running things on their own, sort of a de facto state of independence, because of course, without the king, without the vice, without the king, the viceroy has no power. And so there was an immediate power struggle between the forces of the viceroys, the royalist forces, and these new ruling juntas set up in all these sort of capital cities here, which would then uh, govern in the king's name. And so the abdications of Bayon kicked off this independence movement, and it led Francisco de Miranda to return to establish what's called the first Venezuelan Republic. They decided that this ruling junta should be democratically elected. Uh, they were supported by local elites, like a young guy named Simon Bolivar, who we're going to talk about a lot more in the future here. Bolivar was a young Latin American, was a young Venezuelan uh, noble, or uh, a Creole. And he, uh, he had vast estates, but he supported this whole independence movement. And so he would join Francisco de Miranda's government, and they would set up this new Venezuelan republic, declare independence, and then immediately go to war with royalist forces. All of the Venezuelans did not support this new government. And so in a lot of regions of Venezuela, we started to see royalists pop up who wanted to stay attached to Spain. And so that's one of the political divides we're going to see here in Latin America. The other divide is the, is, the, is the battle between centralists and federalists. Centralists like Bolivar and Miranda wanted these new Spanish countries to have a solid, powerful central government, whereas federalists wanted each of the local ruling juntas to make most of the decisions. And so there's going to be both a battle between royalists and patriots and also a battle between centralists and federalists that's going to make it really hard to unite these new Latin American countries. Eventually, the first Venezuelan Republic kind of collapsed on its own. There were, in the, there were some Spanish royalist forces there, but a massive earthquake in Caracas in uh, 1812 led the central cathedral to collapse, crushing a lot of, uh, crushing a lot of the revolutionaries. This was seen by, a special, by the royalist-leaning priests and the clergy as a sign from God that they should join back together with Spain. And so as a result of all of this, the, the first Venezuelan Republic collapsed, Bolivar and Miranda went back into exile, and Spain retook control over their northern colonies. 
Bolivar in exile famously wrote the uh, Cartagena Manifesto, laying out what he saw as the problems with Venezuela. So take a moment, pause and read this, and then we'll come back together and move forward. Bolivar then launches another campaign to try to liberate his homeland. Starting with just a few hundred troops in Cartagena, he launches what is called the Admiral Camp Admirable Campaign, which becomes Bolivar's hallmark throughout this War of Independence. Bolivar is going to be famous for launching these lightning quick assaults, taking his forces and steamrolling enemy forces, picking up recruits along the way, and basically attacking and defeating Spanish garrisons before they knew they were there. And so this was incredibly effective because he was able to go up the Orinoco River and cross over the mountains and enter Caracas more or less before the Spanish knew he was there. And so before, before Bolivar knew it, he was across the mountains with an increasingly large force. He brought some of the new Gr Granadans from Cartagena with him into Venezuela. And together they entered into Caracas after Bolivar declared his quote unquote war of the death, war to the death. So take a moment and pause and read the war to the death and answer questions associated with this, and then we'll pick it up and move on. Bolivar's war to the death helped him recruit people from his, for his cause, of course, because they didn't want to get shot. But it also created a lot of enemies for Bolivar and really prevented him from getting the sort of popular consensus that you'd need to rule a new country. But at the same time, he was able to get enough support from people like uh, Paulo de Santander here from uh, New Granada and was able to launch an assault, take the city of Cartagena, and declare the, quote, second Venezuelan Republic, now with Bolivar as the head of state. So for the second time now, Venezuela is free of Spanish control, and Bolivar has uh, succeeded in his goal of conquering, of conquering and liberating his homeland. Unfortunately, royalist forces then gathered and, uh, and re-mustered re themselves to move against Bolivar. Most famously, a guy named Jose Thomas Boves here raised a group of sort of cowboys from a region called the Janos, who were uh, incredibly tough fighters and uh, you know generally disliked centralized government. These legions of hell were not particularly political, but Boves did lead them on a series of looting campaigns against the Second Venezuelan Republic, crushing Bolivar at the Battle of La Puerta and forcing him into exile. Bolivar at this point had already alienated enough people that he had basically fled, that he was, he was already sort of being pushed out, but his defeat at the hand of Boves led to the collapse of the Senate Second Venezuelan Republic and Central, Northern Central America, or I'm sorry, Northern Latin America collapsed again into chaos. In exile, Bolivar again wrote a famous letter laying out the reasons why he felt like Latin America was struggling. So take a moment, pause and read the letter from Jamaica, and then we'll pick it up and move forward. Bolivar in exile in Jamaica was declared by, from the other revolutionaries, El Jefe Supremo, or the leader of the revolutionaries. He, this was because he was the only guy up to this point that had had significant success. And so despite the fact that he had a lot of disagreements with his revolutionary allies, he was still declared the leader of the revolution. He went to Haiti, the only other independent country, and got some uh, new weapons and launched a new assault on Latin America, but his enemies tricked him and uh, he thought a much larger force was descending upon him on the beach and he's going to again get pushed out. And then he launched another assault because if there's one thing Bolivar does not do, it is give up, launched another assault and this time he was successful. So he's going to, on his fourth attempt, he's finally going to reestablish control, push the royalist forces out and is going to sit down with other revolutionaries at the Congress of, Angus, Angus, of Angostura and is going to lay out this whole system of government that he proposes. So take a moment and pause, read his message to the Congress of Angostura, and we'll move forward. It's about this time that Spain really starts to get involved in this whole deal. Uh, the Spanish forces, the ruling junta in Spain, dispatches a general named Pablo Morillo to attempt to pacify and retake over Latin America. And so he and his massive army are going to show up and immediately start pushing Bolivar and his forces out of the areas in which they've gained. He's going to take back the city of Cartagena, recapture New Granada, and start threatening Caracas and Venezuela. Bolivar is going to then head out into the Janos to recruit his own army of cowboys, uh, impressing the uh, cowboys with his riding and swimming skills. Apparently, he was known as Iron Ass because he could ride a horse all day without getting tired. And he was a super good swimmer. 
and he would like best the cowboys in like feats of strength and swimming, once out swimming a man with his hands tied behind his back. So all of this impressed the, uh, the cowboys of the Janos, and he's going to recruit a guy named Jose Antonio Paz to lead his, his uh, Janos, his cowboys, for his Janeiro forces into battle and use them against the sort of Spanish forces who've arrived. So now that the cowboys are on Bolivar's side, we're gonna, he's going to win the Battle of La Puerta and start pushing Pablo Murillo, stop him from invading Colombia. And so we're going to see a series of battles, including uh, both La Puerta and Calabozo, in which Bolivar and Paz are successful in pushing out Murillo. And then he's going to launch a lightning assault over the mountains. Uh, this famous Andes crossing happened uh, during the winter. And so shockingly, Bolivar was somehow able to uh, bring his forces over the Andes Mountains in the middle of the South American winter to surprise the royalist forces at the Battle of Boyacá, defeating them and liberating what was then, what was then New Granada, or what is today uh, Colombia. With royalist forces already on the ropes, the mutiny of Cadiz happens. This is in the aftermath of the Spanish Restoration and Ferdinand retaking the Spanish throne. He's going to raise an army to go to Latin America and help out Pablo Murillo. But once this army realizes where they're going to be sent to and uh, what might happen to them, they instead decide that they'd rather not. They mutiny, they march on Madrid, and they force Ferdinand to accept a liberal constitution and basically make him pledge he will not send them to Latin America. And so this, for Pablo Murillo, means that the game is up. He has now has no support from, uh, from Spain. And so he and Bolivar are going to reach a truce. He's going to get on a boat and head away. And Bolivar has now liberated all of northern South America, this country that he is going to call Gran Colombia. So the Battle of Carabobo is the last battle against the remaining royalist forces. With Pablo Murillo gone, the royalists are going to be routed by Bolivar and Paz. And they're going to be driven out of Latin America forever. And Latin America is now going to be liberated and free after June of 21. Bolivar is going to declare this new country of Gran Colombia. Unifying together the countries of Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela. He is going to become president of this with uh, Santander of, uh, of New Granada, of uh, Cartagena becoming the uh, vice president of this new Latin American Republic. Here he is uh, laying out the Bolivarian constitution. So take a moment and pause, read, answer questions, then we'll move on. Down in South, down in South, South America, down in what is today Argentina, there was also a revolution happening, happening against Spanish forces. The May rebel revolution happens in result, in, as a result of the abdications of Bayon. And the guy who rises to power out of this is a guy named Jose de San Martin. Jose de San Martin is one of the revolutionaries coming out of this May Revolution, and he's going to put together a massive military force called the Army of the Andes, which he and a guy named Bernardo O'Higgins of Chile are going to lead to try to liberate the rest of Latin America. In the, uh, in the state of Cuyo in western Argentina, San Martin is going to build this massive war machine, supplying all this stuff for himself, making his own gunpowder, making his own weapons, making his own cannons. And then they're going to lead this army across the mountains into Chile, surprising royalist forces and liberating the, uh, and liberating the independent country of Chile in 1817. So we have this famous crossing the mountains also of, of San Martin and O'Higgins. And they are then going to join together to go up and liberate Peru building a massive navy led by a British officer named uh, Thomas Cochran, who was known as the Sea Wolf. You probably don't need to know that. But they launch an assault on the city of Lima, capturing it and liberating all of Peru and then yeah, and Bolivia. And so with Lima falling, the last royalist stronghold is gone. And so now you've got two massive sources of power within Latin America. You've got Bolivar and Gran, Gran Colombia up in the north of South America, and you've got San Martin and O'Higgins down in the south. There's a massive rebellion in between them in Quito, in Quito and Bolivar is going to lead troops southward into Quito to pacify this rebellion, take it over, and ensure that this disputed territory in, in between Peru and Gran Colombia is going to be Gran Colombian territory. 
to resolve this territorial dispute, Bolivar and San Martin meet at the Guayaquil Conference, where the two great liberators of Latin America meet face to face. They don't get on super well. San Martin, it turns out, was a royalist, not a Republican, and a federalist, not a centralist. So he's basically the political opposite of Bolivar. Uh, he's also an opium addict who was not super political in general. And so he decided that uh, they decided that there wasn't room for both of them, that Bolivar was going to rule all of this and San Martin was going to go back and uh, enjoy his opium. So Bolivar emerges from this conference uh, as the leader of Latin American forces. He's going to lead, the, lead the, these forces on the liberation of Bolivia next, moving up into the Andes Mountains and defeating Spanish, the Spanish forces in the last couple battles. And now Spanish forces are gone. All of Latin America is liberated. And Bolivar is the supreme leader of all of this. As you can see in this document, he declares himself the supreme dictator of all of Latin America with the dream of expanding Gran Colombia into Peru, Chile, and maybe even Bolivia, and maybe even Argentina. But he's going to face constant rebellions and pushback from local leaders who don't want to put themselves under the rule of Bolivar and want to limit his power. And so what we end up seeing is a number of assassination attempts, which uh, take a moment and pause and read this assassination attempt, and then we'll move on. A number of assassination attempts lead Bolivar weakened and demoralized. Uh, suffering from a variety of different health concerns and having to escape from one assassination attempt by jumping out a window and hanging out under a bridge, Bolivar finally decides that it's time for him to leave Latin America and allow all of the other sort of leaders of their countries to control their country's fate. And so here's Bolivar's farewell letter. So we'll take a moment, pause and read it. And with this sad note, all of the countries of Gran Colombia break away. Bolivar's heir apparent, a guy named Sucre, is assassinated. Santander becomes the leader of Colombia. Paz becomes the leader of uh, Venezuela. Peru breaks apart and becomes its own thing. Bernardo O'Higgins becomes the supreme leader of Chile. And each of these countries, each of these guys becomes known as caudillos, military leaders who are going to take over each of these Latin American countries. And they're going to have constant power struggles with other Latin American leaders trying to control each of these societies. And so they're going to struggle to establish regular constitutional government. They're going to struggle to have a regular sort of uh, a regular transfer of power between these different groups. And what you're going to see is very, very unstable Latin American republics, each of them ruled by these military dictators. Bolivar himself is going to die before actually leaving Latin America. But his legacy, as he stated here, is that they're going to, quote, fall into, uh, the country will fall inevitably into the hands of the unrestrained multitudes and then into the hands of tyrants so insignificant they will be almost imperceptible of all colors and races. And that becomes pretty, that's pretty prescient. That's more or less the story of what's going to happen to Latin America for the next approximately 100 years until we come back and check in with them again and see how things are doing. So that's Latin American independence. Thank you for bearing with my failing voice for today. And uh, when we come back tomorrow, we'll move up north to talk about the independence movement in Mexico. Thank you for listening.